This conference will now be recorded. Sandwiches are great. Well, it is. Did you did you did you the sandwiches? Thank you. What what kind of sandwiches are we talking about? They're good too. I don't can't really have it right now. Clerk, please start the recording. Today is Wednesday, June 14th, 2023, and I'd like to call today's work session to order. Tonight we have Burke presenting, is Burke on the call with us? Okay. Please welcome Catherine Goetz, hopefully I didn't butcher that Catherine, Virginia Gleason and Brian Murphy from Burke Consulting. They will be presenting virtually the Ridgefield Police services study this evening oh yes we do want a roll call don't you you want one yeah clerk can i get a roll call councilmember fox present councilmember casberg here but i council member is in the car so i gotta go grab him uh present councilmember servany she's just running a few minutes late mayor strobin present Thank you, Clerk. All right. Um, please welcome Catherine, Virginia, and Brian from Berg Consulting. Hi there. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Catherine Gitz. I'm with Berg Consulting. My colleague Brian may be a few minutes late. Um, if he pops in, I can um, allow him to introduce himself. But um, I'll allow Virginia and Tag Gleason to introduce themselves, and then we can um, go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Virginia Gleason, uh, based here in Seattle, retired from uh, working with uh, four different police departments and do consulting now, uh, along with Burke on various issues related to policing. And I'm Tag Gleason, also based in Seattle, uh, 40 years of police service, and a subject matter expert for our consulting. Thank you. Uh, could you go to the next slide? So we've done some uh, brief introductions. Um, I'll provide a little bit of context for the study. 
we'll talk a little bit about our methods and some guiding principles and then key findings. And then we'll go uh, through each of the major elements in uh, a potential contract. And um, then Virginia, I'll turn it to Virginia and Tag, and they can talk a little bit about potential benefits and risks. And then we'll have time for questions. Uh, if you'd like, I could we could pause at each slide for questions, or we could move ahead and hold those to the end. Or if there are questions that arise, we can certainly take a pause. Any, any requests on that? I think no. we can just pop in as we have questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So the purpose of the study was to explore the feasibility of the city of Ridgefield to provide police services for the city of La Center. So we evaluated uh, the different elements to consider in a contract and we identified some potential benefits and some concerns. We uh, One thing we looked at um, is population and uh, trends in calls for service in both cities and looked at the impact of growth in uh, not only the city of Ridgefield, but the, the uh, region on the Ridgefield Police Department. So as you know, this is a contractual uh, relationship is one option that the city of La Center is exploring. Um, so we're looking at um, staffing, contract terms, I mentioned poten potential benefits and risks. And um, we do want to consider the, the context of the region of growth in commercial and residential major retailers that are coming to the area and how that will impact uh, the police department uh, as is. Could you go to the next slide? Thank you. So we uh, did quite a few interviews. We interviewed uh, the interim chief there in La Center, the former mayor in La Center, uh, several members of the Ridgefield Police Department, and several partner agencies, such as the um, Municipal Court in Battleground um, and CRESA, the um, emergency communications uh, agency down there. We also did some research reviewing other interlocal agreements between two cities or between uh, counties and cities. And Virginia has worked on quite a few of these up here in King County and could speak to her experience as well. We did a uh, ride along with a couple of officers to both cities and got a great tour. So we, and heard their personal experience as well. Uh, I'll pause briefly. I'll let Brian, Brian join. I'll just let him introduce himself and then um, we can continue. He can, he can jump in a little bit and then we can, yeah. Good evening, everyone. I apologize for being late. My uh, previous meeting went a little bit long. Um, happy to be with you this evening. Catherine, why don't you carry on and I'll just uh, follow along and enjoy the discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can go to the next slide. These are uh, the guiding principles that we are incorporating, that we did incorporate Sorry, in our, yeah. This is Council Member Boyle. Um, I was curious with the interviews that you guys did. You said you uh, interviewed several other agencies, and I would assume Ridgefield being one of them. Um, did you guys do any interviews with any of the other um, uh, police departments that are currently uh, fulfilling any of our vacancies with um, shifts we that we have? Yeah. Uh, you we did, did not. We no, we did not. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, so these are some principles that, based on our interviews and based on our um, input from. Ridgefield Police Department and folks in La Center, 
that we work to incorporate in our analysis and our report. Uh, the first is that officers working in List Center would be Richfield Police Department employees and supervised by the Richfield Police Chief. Uh, the city of Richfield would uh, coordinate all messaging and communications as a uh, part of uh, that organization. Richfield Police Department would provide a uniform level of service across, across both cities. It would essentially extend its level of service to the center, not provide a different level. And as in any contractual relationship, uh, shared expectations and processes for communication would be really important to establish and you know, provide a basis for success. Could you explain a little bit further about what the messaging uh, would be? I think the point there is that this, this point in general is important to the city of Ridgefield and the city manager, that they speak with one voice, they, they have coordinated messaging, and just reflecting that uh, as one department in that city, that it would be part of that kind of overall city of Ridgefield uh, messaging. Does that make, does that help? Well, are you talking like PIO uh, type of, of issues where there's media context to it, or are we talking about a broader scale of mission vision statements? I think this relates more to public information, as you mentioned, like a PIO type function that that would be coordinated, you know, along with other departments in the city. Um, just that it would be, you know, one one department, uh, one team, one part of the organization there, and those employees would um, those officers that worked in the center would be part of that team. Okay. Uh, you can go to the next slide. These are some key findings based on our uh, interviews and our research and our analysis that uh, the city of Ridgefield partic in particular is growing rapidly uh, and we'll have to address uh, growing public safety needs regardless. Um, the proposal for contractual services would be adv advantageous for both cities because of things like shared costs, coordinated policing, and some growth opportunities for staff, which we heard come up in quite a few conversations. Uh, there are some concerns uh, that to be mindful of, including uh, capacity in the department. Um, as it grows, there's a lot of state mandates, there's a lot of processes, there's a lot of um, internal initiatives to work on. Um, staffing considerations, um, you know, they would have to hire up, they'd have to add staff, and that takes time. And some uh, systems limitations, um, I think it would be to uh, work out a process to make sure that they can collect data and track it and, you know, have that data available so that uh, it would be reflective of calls in each community and it would, you know, provide good reports for the city of La Center. Is there something in addition to what's already in place countywide that that would be needed for the systems? Uh, Virginia, do you want to, could you talk a little bit about this? So one of the limitations we're seeing has to do with um, Cress's ability to um, have a single Ridgefield Police Department and be able to segregate out the La Center calls from the Ridgefield calls. It will, in order to get accurate statistics related to each city, it will require the officers to um, sign out of one system and sign, sign back in um, with the Ridgefield credentials for one and La Center credentials to be able to get extremely accurate crime data. Otherwise, if it's all put just 
because of the particular um, CAD and RMS system that they have at CRUSA, um, it would be a, a huge administrative burden for them to have to go through call by call by call and sort of divide them out. Um, so Chief Richardson gave us some ideas of ways that they could maybe mark um, different calls to make them easier to segregate out, but the system itself doesn't it doesn't lend it to easily be able to track things with the two different cities. We're looking at workarounds on ways that there can be searchable information in the system, or it's possible that the officers will just have to log out of the one system as they if they toggle between cities, but that's just a little bit of a system limitation, and that's based on the specific CAD RMS project product that uh, Clark County has. Okay. Okay, you can go. Oh, you can go ahead. Thank you. So these next uh, slides will just touch on the different. Uh, elements in a contract and I have a few thoughts on each of those. So this one is about the service delivery model. And I mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, in, in this model, Ridgefield Police Department would extend its service level to the center. It would basically treat the center as it does, as it treats the city of Ridgefield and provide one level of service. So to provide 24-7 uh, coverage, an additional six patrol officers would be needed. So that's the number of officers that we included in our uh, estimates. Uh, two positions would be recommended for additional records and administrative support. And the two cities uh, expressed interest in uh, potentially adding a detective position to uh, bring some work in-house and provide an opportunity uh, for staff, a growth opportunity. Next slide, please. Uh, these maps just show a little bit of context, which you're obviously familiar with, but just showing um, Ridgefield on the, on the left there, Ridgefield and the center um, in comparison to each other, just showing the full, the full scope of the service area for Ridgefield PD. Uh, so Ridgefield and the center there on the left and a, a detailed closer up map of the center on the right. Next slide. Um, so each city has uh, several contracts with outside service service providers. We mentioned CRESA, also with Clark County Sheriff um, and with the Battleground Municipal Court. So in general, it would be recommended that Ridgefield PD manage one contract with most of these service providers to cover both cities rather than having two independent contracts uh, with the exception of the Battleground Municipal Court, um, it's based on some input from court staff and um, some interviews. Uh, there are a few costs that La Center would continue to pay directly, such as for the jail and for towing and impound. Next slide. Ridgefield PD would uh, maintain, maintain all police reports and they would prepare regular reports uh, for the Center City Council for, and for staff. Um, if the Little Center City Council had requests, they could go uh, to the mayor and then pass be passed along to the Ridgefield City Manager, so they'd have that relationship there. And the Center Mayor could meet regularly with uh, the Chief and the Ridgefield City Manager. At these meetings, that would be an opportunity to review reports or other data or to ask questions or bring up concerns or pass along information that the, the mayor is, wants to speak directly to the chief about. Next slide. Uh, liability and indemnification are important in any contract. Uh, in this case, the two cities would provide mutual indemnity for the actions of each government. Um, and another thing that we saw in these, this type of interlocal agreement is outlining a process for resolving any disputes. Um, and that can be uh, determined 
by the two cities with the advice of um, legal uh, staff or legal, um, you know, legal service. Sorry, Catherine, can you go back one more slide? Sure. Uh, to the request from the La Center City Council would come through the La Center Mayor to the Ridgefield City Manager. Can you explain the background behind that a little bit more? Sure, that's that's based on some input from uh, the Ridgefield City Manager. Um, I guess to have the intent would be to have, you know, a single point of contact or, or not so that any requests or things can really come come directly to the city manager and they're sort of, um, a, you know, more formal process for getting that information to the manager. Um, and then there would be an opportunity for the manager and the chief uh, who the manager is the supervisor of the chief for the for those two folks to meet with the mayor of the center and you know talk in further detail about any requests so are we talking like something like as simple for as like additional support for city functions or does this come at a higher level than that or i guess i think one thing we had talked about is uh there could be um you know an agreement about what kind of requests are you know the simple ones could those go directly to the chief or, or like what kind of requests kind of get elevated to come to the manager and i think that there there could here could be a process to decide like you know is it a question or is it a simple request or is it if it's something more complicated like a change in service level or a concern i think those those should really go I think the idea is that those would go to the manager, city manager, and the chief. Virginia or, or Brian, is there anything that you would add here? Well, I certainly agree um, that this I should be. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I was going to say I agree that this should be the process for, uh, you know, policy and procedural level questions. But you know, if our if our public works director is dealing with a, a, a traffic issue, I would hope that he could contact the chief or the on-duty supervisor directly and just make that request. And of course, it's their discretion at that point whether they move forward with that request or not. But um, yeah, I'd, I would like to see the, the simple uh, staff level questions be handled um, in a more timely manner, in a more simple manner. Then we're not bothering the mayor and the, and the city manager for traffic cones and things like that. Yeah, I think that was the intent is exactly what you're saying. I think it was the concern if, if it is something that, you know, potentially has a budget impact that is more than de minimis, where someone's asking for a special emphasis patrol or uh, for officers to be dedicated to something new, that those would go through a more formalized process. But the day-to-day -day things like you're describing would be uh, definitely you know, a peer to peer without having to go through all that other process. Okay, I would like to ask just one more question on a previous slide since we've already paused the whole show for this. Um, the uh, the towing and, and impound costs, to me, I would rather have the chief of police or whoever her designee is taking a look at those and approving them and if if it can't be contained within the existing contract because if it's going to go to uh, maria or brian they're not going to know a lot of times what that tow bill was was for they're just going to see it and then they'd have to make a phone call to rpd anyway to do it so um you know the other stuff is not as as time sensitive paying for the court costs or the uh or the jail costs so that we can we can verify that but something as simple as towing bills i i would be more comfortable if if ridgefield just took care of that for us and if it was an extravagant expense obviously we could we could deal with that but most tow bills are not not huge and does the city of the center have a tow appeal uh, sort of an appeals process through city administration where people can um, appeal their tow bills? 
We're not we're not aware of that, and we also don't even know the last time we received a tow bill. Okay. We can we can definitely follow up on the the towing and impound costs. Because sometimes if there's uh, like if there's a DUI arrest and they go ahead and they impound the vehicle, um, often the costs go directly to the person whose vehicle is being impounded. But other times, if for whatever reason they don't pay, it ends up reverting back to the city. So it would be good to have some sort of a um, a plan for dealing with tow bills that end up getting charged to the city, but certainly can do follow up on that if it's especially if it's not something that comes up all the time um i don't think probably is a you know a major deal breaker to any sort of agreement but we'll follow up any other questions the next uh piece is about uh compensation we can move ahead to that So we have a few slides here with some uh, details on what this could look like and some charts and some numbers. Um, but to estimate what La Center would pay in a contractual relationship, we looked at two options for uh, sharing costs. And the estimates based on these two options turned out to be pretty similar. But in one, La Center would pay the full direct cost of six the six patrol officers that are needed for 24 seven service, plus a share of supervision and overhead. The second would be that the center would pay a share of the total department costs. Um, so in either scenario, the center would pay for patrol staff, their vehicles and equipment, and then a share of supervisory and support personnel supplies and services, um, facility, space, and contracted services. Next. So this chart on the right here is, is providing a comparison for the estimated cost of a fully staffed uh, police department in the center. And that's the solid line and that's compared to the um, estimated cost of contractual service, which is represented by these two um, dotted lines, which are the two different uh, cost sharing options, which you can see are pretty similar. Um, over time, either option would provide a savings for the center compared to the cost of its own department. And that really is based on a few things. Um, shared supervision, there would be one chief instead of two, uh, there would be a shared lieutenant and shared uh, supervision from sergeants, um, shared support staff, um, shared facility space, and shared uh, contractual services. Um, you can see that here year one is higher, and that includes some one-time vehicle and equipment purchases. Um, these may not happen all right away. This cost may actually you know, be spread depending on when um, on the timing of hiring and when hiring happens. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, this is a similar look um, at cost estimates for um, the Ridgefield Police Department. Again, that solid line is showing um, the status quo, assuming that they do grow to address, um, you know, an assumed growing need because the, the city's growing. Um, and then the, the dotted lines are showing the share for Ridgefield PD were it to be in a contractual relationship. It, so it does provide, we estimate it provides a financial benefit for Ridgefield as well compared to um, the status quo. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the uh, numbers, the cost estimates that are uh, supporting the charts that we just saw showing a, an estimate for um, the center's department budget on the top and then the two options underneath and showing a, a cost savings over time. Uh, the the Le Center department budget um, 
is based on being fully staffed. It does include some um, estimated savings based on historical trends. So may not completely line up with the current budget, but we do have all the information and we just are assuming um, some uh, under expenditure here. That's why it may look a little different. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a similar uh, table for the Ridgefield Police Department. Um, the top would be if it were to not provide service to the center, but continue to uh, grow uh, to meet the community need. And then its share of a contractual relationship um, for either of these cost options. And it similarly shows um, a savings over time. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in regards to contract startup, uh, hiring new officers uh, can take time. And Ridgefield PD uh, estimates that it would have to use overtime to provide its standard level of service in the beginning. Uh, this chart is an example to show some milestones in a potential contract, including when new officers could be on patrol. Uh, it can take over a year from hiring a new officer to that person being on patrol. Uh, this depends on uh, some things like the pool of candidates the, and the number of spots in the law enforcement academy. Uh, Ridgefield could uh, potentially get lateral officers and that takes a lot less time. And it could get, potentially get additional spots in the academy, which would, would speed up this process. So this is an example it's kind of on the, the long end of how long this process could take, um, but just to, to provide a visual for that. Uh, next slide. So the uh, final piece here on the contract elements is the agreement term. So we, we think a multi-year contract would provide benefits for both cities, um, and, and we have based our estimates on a five-year contract. Uh, it would give Ridgefield PD time to hire staff and to uh, incorporate them and, and provide, um, you know, get used to providing the, the service to both cities and would provide predictability for both cities. Um, regarding the costs, the two cities could review actual costs that were incurred each year and then adjust costs for the following year. For example, if hiring happens at a different pace than planned, the costs may be different, and the center should really pay its share of actual costs. And no any contract, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I just was gonna mention the last point about um, the timing on an option to terminate and then, but please go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I just, um, who came up with the idea of the five years? Because that's what I was thinking as far as the hiring process. Like if that doesn't go as planned, who kind of picked that? Because if both cities are getting a cost savings more over time, would it make sense to, I mean, I'm just curious who picked the five years? Um, that's what we selected as based on some examples we've seen of a kind of standard term. Sometimes it could be a five years with a renewal it could be, you know, different periods with either an automatic renewal or or a time for renewal, um, but that was what we um, assumed. Okay. Is there like negotiation on that part as far as starting out with a certain a different, like a ten year plan with an extended, you know, with a, a chance to renew? I'm just curious. I think so. Do you recall, Brian or Virginia? I think, I, I don't think, I think this is, a, a, you know, a, an element to, to discuss for sure. I would, I would agree. I'd say all of these points are really, you know, a starting point for a conversation. We really wouldn't recommend a term shorter than five years because of the startup oh, required. Um, no, no. <laughs> um, and then I, I guess I would just note that the, the right to terminate sort of makes the term of the contract a little bit, you know, a little bit less weighty, I suppose, because there is that right to terminate and that's fairly common as well. 
And we would hope that if it's a five-year contract or a 10-year contract, the cities are entering into it with a good faith of, of retaining that contract for that period. But if things aren't, you know, uh, aren't satisfactory to either party, there is that opportunity to terminate as well. Okay, thank you. Can you go to the next slide? Um, I'm actually gonna turn this over to Virginia and Tag, and they can talk a little bit about the potential benefits and uh, a few risks. So um, having worked with several different contract relationships with the sheriff's office, with uh, you know a dozen or so contracts, as well as with some uh, cities working jointly, such as um, Snoqualmie and North Bend and um, you know, Carnation and Duval, what we see as the benefits of the contracting are some of the things Catherine already talked about. You get the cost of save savings with shared staff, shared space, um, some economies of scale on training and different things, um, and that can be really helpful. Um, I'll let my husband Tag talk a little bit about the conversations he had with officers about benefits that they really saw and why they're strongly supporting um, this uh, merger of La Center and Ridgefield for police services. Yeah. Uh a benefit to start with, both organizations seem to have a compatible culture. There's a focus on providing a level of service, typically not seen in policing, and they were all committed to continuing that. So they also recognize that it'll take a while to staff up uh, both organizations for the growth that's occurring in the area. And in this situation, it's coming and they're, they don't want their uh, organizational cultures or uh, the level of service they can provide to be adversely affected. And when you're uh, upstaffing an organization of any size, when those new people are being brought on, uh, it's a sensitive issue to maintain the service level expectations that both jurisdictions have. And the growth is going to occur down there. And from looking at at least the operational issues involved, it appears that the type of uh, police situations that could arise will become more complex with the uh, casino in the area, and the increased traffic going through the area. This gives the staff of uh, uh, the, the PD an opportunity to develop the skills over time that will be needed for that and also a big issue is giving time to bring on new people who can uh, acclimate to the new uh, uh, service expectations, which are pretty high. And I think that um, in the smaller departments, sometimes part of that balance is officers all really like to be able to pr provide really good service to the department. And a lot of times you don't have the time to be able to do that the way you want to. So on the one hand, what a lot of the officers like is they really get to know the community. They feel like um, they can do some problem oriented um, policing, some community policing, but you every once in a while having a high profile event, it makes you feel really good about the, the how you're protecting the community. So a larger department gives them that balance of, of I'm not saying crime is a good thing, but there are some times when there is this satisfaction of saying, I did this thing that was that really provided value to my community because there was a robbery or, a, you know, a, we were able to solve a crime problem in the community. The larger department gives that just perfect balance. And there's a lot of reasons that the Le Center and Ridgefield are really attractive for people to come work there. There's a sense of community values. There's a sense of support from the elected officials that you don't see a lot of places. And especially in some of your neighboring agencies, there's officers looking at this area to say, I want to work in that community, but I don't want to just be doing house checks. I want to have a little bit of, of, uh, 
a variety in what I can do and maybe be able to develop my skills as a detective or work on a regional team. And growing the, the departments would allow for more of those opportunities. And um, I, I think right now, retain, attracting and retaining staff is a challenge for everyone. And this would help to both attract and retain staff. And uh, you would have a highly experienced police chief who in our conversations with her, we found her to be an excellent pick. She's experienced, uh, she's from the area, she understands what's going on there. And it's a propitious opportunity to uh, combine to address the future. And it seems to be coming at the right time with the right people. Um, one of the other things is, you know, ha having used a lot of um, kind of patchwork resources to provide um, service to the city of La Center as, you know, things have happened over the last couple of years. Um, with some of the new requirements that are out about having some standardization for things like initiating stops, um, using force, investigating um, uh, uses of force, it can be valuable to have a unified command over the people who are providing backup. So when you have that patchwork of people, sometimes at, a, at an event that, that might unfortunately require um, some kind of force to be used, or you know, if unfortunately there was an officer-involved shooting, if you don't have people whose policies are uniform across the board, um, there's going to be some question about how that was managed and how that will be reviewed. There's a lot more um, standardization uh, if you have one department with a unified command providing backup to both. Plus, people will know the cities more, and if there are unique things going on, whether it's areas that have enhanced crime or um, a certain way that they are approaching their problem-related policing in the area, it's really valuable to have these two departments or two cities under unified command providing backup to each other. And politically, from a risk management perspective, uh, the uniformity and consistency will be helpful because often uh, plaintiffs will want to include both jurisdictions in any kind of action, but they'll also uh, try to point out disparities in policies, uh, staffing, training, to demonstrate uh, what's, what uh, perspective is more favorable for that case. And here you'd have the uniformity to say, this is just the way business is done. So good risk management practice. So any questions about the benefits? I have a question about more about back to kind of the contract term and the ability to terminate it within like six to 12 months. How does that look? Or how, I don't have any clue what police contracts look like. So that's why I'm asking. When that happens, let's say that was to happen, does one side, the person, whoever, basically the center in this case, do we get to, you have now, you have these six extra officers and let's say over after this time period or after so much time, maybe three, four extra officers. Now you guys maybe can't afford that and maybe we need to have some and maybe we can afford to keep some. Do we get to have some of those officers kind of come over to the center at that point so that we're not going from zero, you know, from, great coverage to now nothing. I mean, how does that kind of look for a transition from, because obviously, yeah, five years to me doesn't seem like that long, but also if you're gonna, if we have this in the contract, then that it doesn't really matter how long the contract is, if anybody can terminate it within that short amount of time. So what does that mean for listener and how can we make sure that we're still covered after that? So there's a couple different ways that you can manage employees who, if there's a downsizing. So there's uh, there's sort of these tiers of personnel rules. So one is the civil service rules. So state civil service rules have a process for governing when uh, a department downsizes and where those people would go. Um, and unfortunately, 
way back in the days when we had to lay off police officers in the past, um, I had to go through this. And so um, there is a way where if the city said we have too many and we're choosing not to keep them, um, the, the jurisdiction that previously contracted with them, they are offered there first. Um, so that's one way. There's also, it'll depend, the next overlay is what might be in a labor contract. Um, almost always, the if there are layoffs, they're going to be done in um, order of seniority, um, and not seniority number of years worked, but actually number of years worked in that department. So um, there, there, there's a whole way to manage uh, excess employees in the event there's a contract termination. Okay, thank you. Chime in here. So, so the expectation would be that as part of the negotiations, this section would include uh, a dispute resolution process. So it wouldn't just be in a vacuum that all of a sudden there's a six month termination, a 12 month termination. Ordinarily, there'd be an expectation that the parties would be in good faith, try to resolve. Maybe the next step would be mediation. Maybe you have arbitration. You know, there's a there's a process there, and so you usually see short term. Um, uh, termination clauses where there's the potential for uh, going into the contract that there's going to be some conflict. What I'm hearing here is that there's this expectation that the communities are coming into this in good faith, trying to resolve this potential issue. And so um, your question is a good one in the sense that <clears throat> a short-term terminate termination does have significant impacts. You've already budgeted, for example, right. for the next right. year. And so ordinarily, again, I recognize this is part of the negotiations. I may or may not be part of that, but um, ordinarily you'd see something like this have a kind of a longer term, like more of a 12 month termination. I think well, that lends, yeah. lends itself to I think what you're asking about, because there are some other implications and, you, and the individual brought up, you know, contract impacts with your union negotiations, for example. So again, those are subject to negotiation, but those are good questions. But again, it's a, it's a process. Sure, sure. I was just curious, yeah, how that looks because it just seems awfully quick, like not short notice. And like I said, I mean, to my knowledge, the cost of this is not, it's going to cost us the majority of our police budget. It's not like we have all this extra, we're just sitting over here saving, saving for that cold rainy day when we have to, you know, maybe pull up our own officers out of a hat, you know? So it's like, we have to just be careful with that money and making sure that, yeah, we still have service and yeah, it makes sense that that would be part of that. So thanks. For example, when the city of North Bend decided to terminate their contract with King County, um, it, they discussed it for two or three years before they actually gave the notice to say, we are going to, uh, and again, it was all in good faith. There was discussions about, you know, you are doing certain things and your capacity doesn't meet our needs anymore. And um, we think we want to do something different. But there was there was years of discussion before they finally said, we want to um, a ring the bell that now this this uh, termination period begins and gave everyone uh, you know plenty of time to plan and to take appropriate measures to make sure their city was still protected. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I would hope that it would go that way. I mean, I yeah, that makes sense. We have just one more slide, I, I think, uh, that we can speak to. So this is the slide that's not so much fun as the potential benefits. Um, and there are, you know, these your cities are growing rapidly. And um, so having the ability to plan um, on providing the amount of service for rapidly growing communities. That's that's hard enough as it is. But then there is a lot going on in policing right now. There's a lot going on with the state, with the attorney general's office, and with some of the expectations that I'd say primarily are coming out of Olympia. Sometimes they come out of county councils, but right now they're primarily coming from the state where they are adding layers of reporting requirements and training requirements onto individual departments that uh, in some some cases could be straining 
ability to pr provide service. So for example, one of the, the items under discussion is if they're going to mandate that um, all officers wear body cameras, um, there's a whole lot of administrative burden that goes with kicking off a body worn camera process. There's storage costs, redaction costs, huge public disclosure costs. So the, there's just some of that can, can uh, strain your ability to provide service. Um, the other thing that is becoming less of a, a, a bottleneck on the hiring process are available slots in the academy. So they've started with the rollout of regional academies. The first one opened in the Tri-Cities and currently there are spots available there. And I think, um, and there's discussion about having a regional facility right in Clark County. So as those regional training facilities open, I think we'll see less of a backlog of people waiting to get into academies. Because right now, the, the chart that Catherine was showing about the, from the time that you actually have an in-person be your employee to get them through the academy and then have them do their probationary training so they can be out on the street fulfilling a patrol district can take a while. I think that's going to shorten up a little. But that has to be balanced with all these additional administrative burdens that are coming. Um, the other thing that I mentioned before is this is a really favorable place to to live and work. You've got a you know a, in a lot of ways a better quality of life than you see a lot of other places in the state. And balancing that quality of life with cost of living um, is really appealing. Uh, so I think getting rid of that that backlog at the State Academy, being able to put more people in, um, being able to attract lateral officers and have the training officers, um, they're just, it's just gonna take some planning. And then you always hope that because of the nature of the job, it only takes a couple of bad injuries that create you know, six or eight months of vacancy that you know, create a little bit more strain on your department. On the flip side, part of the benefit of having a larger department is it, it helps you get through the peaks and valleys of staffing when you have a larger pool of people to be able to um, you know, deal with a short absence or someone who's out on family leave. Um, hiring, hiring processes, um, uh, Ridgefield works with an agency that, that does testing throughout the year and they are streamlining some of their processes related to civil, their internal civil service so that they're getting people in the door a little bit faster. Um, and now that we can get them in the academy, some of those risks are left, less, but they still exist. And we could have another you know, major nationwide blowout uh, about policing that could sort of dry up the pipeline of people wanting to come in. Uh, but those are you know, just something that neither city really has a lot of control over. Um, and then the, the last thing is just about the data, the particular CAD RMS system that Caressa uses, it, it's called EIS. We met with the administrator of the system and we talked quite a bit about what are the um, abilities for them to make some changes and uh, do some programming that would you know, spit out really easy, quick, up-to-date crime stats for each jurisdiction. And that's, you know, it's not impossible, but it's not as simple as you would think it probably should be. Um, maybe over time, if, as, as they update or there's you know, a new version or um, maybe if they switch CAD and RMS systems, that might be uh, uh, easier in the future. But right now, that takes a little bit of staff work to make sure that you're getting accurate and timely crime data um, that you that you'll be able to have to um, you know have those conversations uh, about public safety with the city of Ridgefield. Um, again, that's another one of those things that I think over time will get better. But right now, it's it's a little bit challenging. Reports, but I guess I question how re the reporting cannot be pulled by zip code. Well, um, 
there are some ways you can pull the reports. And so sometimes you'll have zip code in CAD data. They tend to work on uh, a different geographic. Uh, so each call might not have a zip code associated with it. So if someone is calling in from a cell phone and they're talking about something that's happening at a particular address, there may not be um, a zip code that is associated with that address that pulls up in the, the way that the PSAP, the public safety answering point works. There could be other ways of looking at that and maybe spending some additional time to actually extract that data and you know, put it in a GIS overlay that would allow you to do some things. Um, but that's not currently a capability the system has. So sometimes what they'll do is they, they'll have other ways that they've drawn it out other than zip codes, um, it, but it's not gonna be by patrol district and it may not also meet your exact city boundaries. So city boundaries, zip codes, census codes, they don't always match with um, what your uh, city boundaries are. But a center address would be easy enough to uh, identify versus a Ridgefield address. Provided the name of the city is in the caller or, um, and if you're ever interested, I can sort of show you what a CAD printout looks like. It may not, um, it may not, ex may not have the city name in there. So there are some systems that actually allow you to use GPS coordinates to be able to pinpoint areas. And then like say, then you overlay them on the city map. Um, and then you could, you can actually use a, like a stylus and draw and say, here's everything that happened in that area. That's not a capability that currently is available in Clark County. Um, so, um, we can ex show some examples about uh, sort of what that raw data is and what is retrievable out of that. Now, once you actually do a crime report and you can do some word searching uh, in the address field, you would be able to do that, but that'd be a little bit of a manual process, but it's definitely doable. Thank you. All right, is there any more questions? Comments? Yeah, I do have just one more question. Um, <clears throat> I understand that this is a, a high level overview of the of the potential for a contract, but was there any thought or any discussion on what the minimum staffing levels would be for um, both jurisdictions. I'm, I'm assuming that Richfield has a minimum staffing level for within their city. Um, was there any look at what that would look like, you know, even once they became fully staffed and we were well into the contract? So I think the, uh, and Chief Doria, sort of has her vision of, of how she would deploy people and staff, but they would look at the center as a single beat with the idea that there would be um, an officer available for that beat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay, thank you. And then the if how that turns into six FTEs is looking at, uh, you know, a 2,080 hour year, and then you back out, um, you know, what 24 hour coverage is, what you have in your labor agreement for vacation time, training time, holidays and everything. And as you back that out, um, the general rule of thumb is for the types of, of schedules that they have is for that one person, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, that takes six FTEs to fill those hours out. Um, of course, there's always gonna be a little bit of, you know, gaps here and there that usually are filled with overtime, but that is the general rule of thumb is six FTEs for one 24 seven 
position. And the additional um, administrative and records uh, staffing, I'm guessing at this point, is predominantly driven by the new legislation with the additional record keeping and body camera requirements and such? There's some of that. There's also um, the public disclosure piece of that, as well as um, our understanding of for fingerprinting services, which currently Clark County um, is providing to residents um, of La Center. Our understanding is Clark County is, is going to sunset that fingerprinting service. So those are all things that take um, additional administrative time. And then with other things going on, there's been a lot of extra activity related to firearms transfers and, and uh, you know, concealed pistol license permits. So things like that are um, part of the additional administrative workload as well. Um, this is Council Member Boyle. I just want to say thank you guys again for your presentation. But um, one more question, uh, just as an overview, um, within the things that we control, um, in your professional opinion, would you say that the benefits are greater than the risks overall between the two cities combining? I, I think so. I think... Um, there's a certain quality of life in those two cities that you don't see very many places. And I think how combining these departments helps both cities keep that, that public safety resource um, for the quality of life. We were both really struck when we rode around the communities and uh, talked to the officers about what they knew and you know, how they were really dedicated to helping people and their families live safely. And like I say, I'm, maybe I'm get kind of jaded. I did retire out of Oakland, California and worked at Seattle and some other places. I haven't seen that for a really long time. And it was really, um, it was really inspiring to talk to these officers. They also knew that there was going to be a little bit of pain in staffing up and getting there. And, and the officers also said, we're willing to suffer a little bit for this greater good for these two cities. And I know that the people, you know, the officers in Ridgefield have a great affection for the city of La Center. Um, and I, it, like I say, for me, it was just great to see that again. And like I say, my husband, who's I think the best community policing officer there ever was, he came back as well feeling the same thing. If, if it's going to happen, it seems like I said, uh, stars are aligned, so to speak, with committed elected officials, uh, police uh, professionals who uh, are willing to go with the process, and uh, a community that uh, will grow and change. And it would, uh, I think, be positive to get the pieces in place to provide the service that the community has come to expect. And I think it's also a good thing that, you know, right now, I mean, we really do have low crime in La Center. So, I mean, as we have low staffing and we're trying to, you know, increase that over time, I mean, it's not like there, it's not like Richard's coming into a stressful situation, I believe. <laughs> I mean, they're coming yeah. into a pretty, you know, manageable place that, you know, they know and understand already. It's not, you know, off the beaten path and, you know, there's some time to grow and evolve together. And I think if, yeah, like you said, communication, understanding the right process that's in place to make sure it works, because, you know, obviously, you know, they're a huge arm's length away, but, you know, there needs to be a line of communication that makes it flow for efficiency. So it, it's a forward collaborative, forward looking collaborative plan. No doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank you so much. This is Councilman Servany again, and I, I concur with the uh, comments that have been said um, by the, the other council members and your staff, and I thank you for the diligence that you've put into the report. Um, I think I, I agree with your thoughts that we're reflecting 
the opportunity and the strength behind giving the officers the dual um, municipality uh, coverage and experiences for keeping um, the, the, the brand new staff um, that come on board oftentimes don't have the variety of tasks and assignments that they need to keep them excited about being on the force. And, and that's what's led to many of the departures that we've had in the past. So I would think you'd probably find the same situations in Ridgefield. So I think the broadening of opportunities are, are, are a big strength for both cities um, in keeping that consistency a little bit longer with the officers, um, giving them that uh, combination of learning um, and in comparing notes of what's going on in both the municipalities and learning from from both, um, you know, with Ridgefield being a, a bit, you know, quite a bit larger and growing faster, we can learn from that. Um, you know, it, it seems to have, as you've said, much more wins than it does risks. And at least the risks that you listed on your report seem in many cases, the risks that would be there anyway, um, irregardless of whether you were covering La Center um, with, with the growth that's incurring in Ridgefield. But thank you. Yeah, this is Council Member Kasberg. I just want to throw out one more one more thing, which is thank you for doing this. And I hope it's not lost on anyone listening that you know the questions that we had regarding this are over really fairly minor things and it's just things that we're trying to try to clarify so i think this was a i think this was a good report thank you all right anything else okay well thank you catherine virginia brian um, we appreciate it the report was done very well so was your presentation with that i'd like to end the city's work session tonight thank you thank you this conference will now be recorded. All right. <laughs> All right. Clerk, please start the recording. Thank you. Today is Wednesday, June 14th, 2023, and I'd like to call today's city council meeting to order. Can we please stand and say Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Clerk, may I please have a roll call? Councilmember Fox? Present. Councilmember Casberg? Here. Councilmember Boyle? Here. Councilmember Strobin? Or Councilmember Servany? <laughs> Present. Mayor Strobin? <laughs> Present. All right. Clerk, please call up any public comments from the audience. Al Villa, 152 West 15th Street. Hey, I got some shout outs. I want to thank the Little League for supplying hot dogs to the veterans. You know, I went down and had mine. Uh, want to thank all the people involved with uh, the Memorial Day uh, festivities out at the cemetery. Want to thank uh, 
was it Mr. Cameron from the high school? Uh, Dominic Stubb was the student who played uh, taps. I want to thank the city for providing the microphone and the, and the speaker, uh, the Lions Club for helping us out, and of course, all the federal veterans that were there. Um, let's see what else. This is all off the top of my head, so you wouldn't know that normally. But uh, <laughs> yeah, they had, we, had, we had the Pride weekend on the Sunday out there, went up there, there was people having fun, don't have any problem with that, you know. Uh, Last week, what was it? The Center United had their forum, you know, whatever you want to call it. And the must have, I was expecting to be, you know, pretty fun, but it was kind of boring. And I had to leave early. So all I can assume is they've, they've solved all the pronoun stuff and everything else because there was nobody up there complaining about it. And so, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and uh, oh, and then Sunday, you notice there was a garage sale down at the old bank building, which is going to be a, a coffee place. If you'd have stopped in there, how many people stopped in there? Raise your hand. If you stopped in. There. You'd have got a free cup of coffee. You'd have got a cookie. <laughs> and if you were charming, you might have even got a free hat. Really? You know, so the next time you drive by something like that, you might want to just pull in because you never know what bling they're going to be giving out. <laughs> you know, and that's River's Edge Coffee. God bless America. Thank you, Al. <laughs> Jim Irish. Jim Irish, 1653 East Heritage Loop, the Center, Washington. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and citizens. On Memorial Day, we had a fantastic show and presentation for the day and for the veterans in the Center. I asked a couple of people that I know and mentioned, well, I didn't see you down there. They came from River's Edge. They lived down there in River's Edge. And they said, we didn't hear anything about it. We didn't know anything about it. I said, it was on the reader board. He says, we don't see the reader board. That's for people coming into the city this way. He says, we come in that way and we go out that way because most of us are out there or else we are going out to the freeway this way. We never get to see the reader's head or the reader board. So I have a question for our fantastic staff and you too, Tony. Uh, with... Uh, ideology the way it is, isn't there a way that we could put another reader board that would not necessarily have to have a stanchion but could run off of um, information being fed to it out, out that side of the city also so that we have both sides of the city covered rather than just the reader board up coming in here. We have a lot of new people coming in. Readers, or River's Edge out there is, is overflowing with people. Excuse me, we got the Highland um, going across the street from it, and we had the other one going up here on Aspen. Ladies and gentlemen, the old saying is, bring the people in here and the business will follow. That's true. But if the people don't know what we've got in the city or what we have going on, then they start looking elsewhere for things to take their time. Skate park is one of the biggest used areas around here starting Monday, the 14th? Friday. Yeah, Friday. 16th for the splash Sixth, pad. Yeah. Anyway, we've done a fantastic job, and we have a really good staff, uh, public work staff, to take care of things. So I would suggest, I got 44 seconds left. I, got, I would strongly suggest that we look at ways that we can keep the city, citizens on both sides of the city full fully invested in what we have coming on. Thank you very much. And like Dow says, God bless you all. Thank you, Jim. Kimberly Elbin. Good evening. I just got off a fishing boat. Yes, the big one got away, but I did. we got four of them. 
And so, Kimberly, can you state your name for the record? Oh, yes, thank, thank you. you. Kimberly Goheen Elbin, life citizen of Clark County. I've lived here for over 30 years where my mother was born here in Les Center. Um, I couldn't attend the GREET uh, uh, meeting for uh, the new mayor, and uh, I'm sorry about that. However, I hope that there will be uh, town halls monthly, if not gatherings for the citizens to unite here in Les Center. I think that's going to be a great time, um, especially with you know, time passing. Um, I actually would like to see no growth, no more growth. Uh, it actually put me in a, a big uh, depression about 30 years ago, and that's okay. Somebody put their roof up and took away my sunrise. That's a, just a personal thing. But, you know, I, I realize people have to live somewhere and all that. I get that. But I am against, uh, I speak at Clark County Council. They are going to be putting... Uh, Sky Rises houses, uh, the low income housing there by the Clark County Fairgrounds. I'm totally against that. Uh, we need to keep, keep Clark County as a country setting. And you can't do that with those uh, homes going up that'll probably be also uh, mandated to uh, house illegal immigrants. So God is always good. Uh, speaking about the reader board, the group called the Le Center United is a great group with wonderful intentions. Yet it is funded and staffed by at uh, and possibly with agendas, obviously by the reader board, that they advertise the uh, the movement that is happening right now. I really resented it. Um, I called up and said, "Well, let's have a heterosexual uh, sign that goes up along with it." I mean, otherwise I'm discriminated against. I mean, it's not a joke. And so um, let's make sure that we watch out for that. Again, they are funded by the federal government, and right now our federal government is going, it, well, Biden's a criminal. So this government's going to soon come to an end uh, as far as history shows. I also want to share that I spoke at Vancouver. Uh, they took our First Amendment rights away, so we get to speak once every three months. And actually, you don't. It's a roundtable social situation, Marxist. And uh, lo and behold, they didn't advertise it right. It wasn't up until... The, Monday's agenda was not um, give, given to the public until Friday at 4.30 that there was an actual meeting for the public to attend and be able to speak about housing. So it was very important. I made it a note that when they were done doing their official greetings and all this, I asked, I stood up and I said, how many citizens are here anyway? And there was only five that I knew of out of about 40 people. And why is that? Well, it's because they don't want people to speak up. We're in a Marxist state right now. You know the state of Washington is ran by Inslee. He's a criminal. So is Biden. So let's kind of wake up, talk to your citizens, get our family back together because hey, they Kimberly, actually Kimberly, you're, you're, you're out of time, Kimberly. drove us apart with that damn mask, <clears throat> excuse me, and the um, pandemic. Thank you, Kimberly. Any other comments, Clerk? There are no many or no more cards from the audience. All right. Any public comments for those calling in, please press star six to unmute yourselves to speak. Do we have any online? We have four. If you'd like to make a public comment, please press star six to unmute yourselves. State your name. All right, moving on. Clerk, are there any public comments to be read? There are none. All right, that moves us on to the consent agenda. If there are no requests for any items to be removed, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Abstained? Motion passes. Thank you, Council. Next up, we will have Superintendent Peter Rosencrantz. He will present an update on the Le Center School District. Peter. Good evening. <clears throat> Peter Rosencrantz, Superintendent, Le Center School District. Um, <clears throat> I do have a couple, I have, I have some announcements for uh, to kind of capture the success of the year and the progress we've made all year long and will continue to make into the next year. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that it's Flag Day. Um, 
So I'm surprised no one else noticed it was Flag Day or mentioned it, but <clears throat> I don't know. The flags were on the bridge, by the way. I appreciate that. I love those flags. Um, and uh, so we had several members of the audience, and I know folks um, around our community that it, because we have an amazing event that happens every spring, which is our graduation. Um, when my kids graduated from Union, they had tickets. We had like four tickets for spots because there's so many people graduating. Um, we still had open seating um, and fa entire families can show up, Commun community members can show up to celebrate with our graduates. Graduates, 98 graduates, amazing opportunity for kids to showcase uh, what they've done for 12 years and where they're headed uh, into the future. And so sending off another uh, group of uh, uh, intelligent and uh, uh, motivated kids into the world, amazing. Um, we are hiring. We have uh, multiple paraeducator positions, and we've been, unlike other school districts, and nothing against them at all. Uh, it's just we're in a growing area. If we were reducing enrollment, it would be a different story. Uh, but we're growing in enrollment, and we are hiring. Um, we had a kindergarten, second grade, and third grade. Typically, with the, the past couple years, with everything going on, we'd have maybe 10, 15 applicants. A good position, we would have 20 applicants. We, uh, most of those positions, or all of those positions had over 80 applicants. Um, what, the third grade position, we hit over 100 applicants. So mm -hmm. that's unheard of for us. Um, it's a great indicator of some of what's going on with our district and what people are hearing. Even though on the outside and in the papers and from a few voices, folks, it's, it makes it sound like some chaos, but it really is. We are focused on our mission statement. We are focused on kids learning and growing brain cells. I'm super excited about where we're headed. Um, so to some of that with teaching and learning, we have new math materials for third through fifth grade, uh, which means, which is the same math materials we have for kindergarten through second. So we have two sets of materials between kindergarten, fifth grade, and sixth grade through algebra two. And the importance of that is for kids having to learn new materials, you lose about six months of learning. And for parents, when they want to help their kids, there's some consistency where we used to jump through four hoops or four different sets of materials. Um, we served 125 kids this year in instructional or interventions for reading to help support reading growth from the COVID learning loss. Um, we are making significant gains. Uh, we'll post some double digit gains in the fall when our scores, test scores come out for all the work that's going on. We're adding a math coach as well um, into this next year because we need to work on math. Math um, success, yes, but not as much as we'd like, and we need to develop or grow um, grow our students. Significant professional development throughout the year to help work with our teachers. Shared leadership for administration and leadership for administration and teachers work together to develop uh, instructional plans and grow their craft instructionally. And then um, significant advanced placement growth and CTE courses at uh, the high school. So all focused on grade 13, so when the kids graduate, they have a plan um, where they head. Facilities-wide, we're improving, uh, continuing to improve safety this summer um, within the buildings. And then I just want to thank our partners. We have a significant number of industry partners, the City of the Center, a uh, Tribal Foundation, um, the works. We, we work to partner with anybody and everybody to help our kids have opportunities and see the opportunities out there in the world and right here in the center, because it's a great place to raise a family, um, live, work, and play. So thank you. It's been an amazing year, and I'm looking forward to next year as well. Perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. All right. Next up is the mayor's report. The farmer's market will start June 22nd at 4 p.m. and will continue on Thursday nights through the summer. I encourage everyone to come out and support the vendors. Concerts in the Park series starts Saturday, June 24th at 5.30 p.m. Harvest Gold and Marianne Fleming will be performing. Next up is the attorney's report. We would like to welcome City Attorney Sean McPherson, who is filling in for Bronson during his vacation this month. Thanks, Mayor Council. I'll, uh, I'll have some additional comments as relates to the Blake fix, which is on your agenda. I just only other thing I'd add is that I have had preliminary discussions with Bronson about 
some other additions to the criminal code, and I would anticipate um, making a few revisions there, and again, presenting that to council, um, likely in conjunction with uh, Bronson when he comes back uh, next month. Thank you. Any questions for the city attorney? All right. Next up is council comments. Council member Fox. Good evening, happy to be here. Happy to see so many familiar faces and some new ones. Um, don't have a whole lot. Um, the mayor kind of said most of what I was gonna say, but I just wanna say uh, thanks Peter for just always coming up and showing up um, each uh, and every two weeks and sharing what's going on in the school. You're right, being in a small community like this, we just have, we get to be more present and I think connect to really what matters, which is, you know, we get to have close connections with our schools and just have so many things to be excited about, about knowing every, you know, kid that walks down the street and knowing the parents. That is the only way to raise your child, I believe. It's just creates such a, um, a safety net and the children, you know, they're kind of in their own little bubble here. That's what I love, you know, and obviously, um, giving them the, the life tools that they need, but also giving them that, um, you know, that small town feel that everybody wants for their kiddos. You know, I have my 20 year class reunion coming up this August, so I'm very excited to go there and um, also be a member of the city council. And um, I'm really excited to connect. You know, I had 95 in my graduating class, so it sounds like we're about the same a little bit. Um, so yeah, and I just wanna say thanks uh, Chief a lot for your work with the um, Bridgefield and all of the things that come up to this point. I know that's probably taken a lot and just for, all of the city employees and everything that you guys do. We just appreciate you guys. And, um, you know, our grounds look beautiful and it's just a beautiful place to live. So thank you. Thank you. Council member Casper. Yeah, good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. And I would completely agree with uh, council member Fox. I think that we as council members forget to acknowledge all of the city staff at the meetings. So thank you guys again. Um, you know, this, the school district was one of the reasons that, that we moved here 10 years ago. So it wasn't Peter, it was before he was there, but I'm st I'm still really happy that, that he's here now. I think it's gotten better. So thanks, Peter. We appreciate that. Um, well, speaking of this, the school, uh, the elementary school had their field day on Monday, and I went and spent the day out there and got a decent sunburn at the on the field um carl ashmore who runs the concession stand at the um at the ball fields donated all of those popsicles so i helped hand out the popsicles to all the kids and most of the teachers there was only two kids that didn't want a popsicle and a couple of teachers so that was it was pretty popular and it was it was hot but it was a good day and it was well, the coolest thing was my son's been involved in little league for four years now five if you count the partial season with with covid but um it was amazing how many of those kids that i that i knew from seeing them at the ball field and so that was just really cool and kind of reminds you of why this is such a cool place to live so um yeah that's really all i got so thanks for coming and thanks for those that showed up and listened to the uh presentation earlier um we would like your input so please send us emails um have your friends go back and watch the presentation that'll be posted online and definitely give us the, the feedback because we can't make those decisions without without the citizens weighing in so thank you what he failed to tell you is that he was accused of cheating in the race on field day <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. i was but she'll admit that i did not participate in the yeah, you left in me the out race the whole thing. i wasn't yeah. even there it's okay in his story i wasn't even there you know it's okay <laughs> i forgot i did oh, she no. melissa fox me? council member sh showed up towards the end of the day <laughs> all right thank you council member boyle uh, good evening everyone <laughs> um yeah everybody thanks for coming out tonight um i'm just gonna kind of piggyback a little bit on what Council Member Casper said, um, I guess, you know, we've sat up here and beat a dead horse, 
night after night through these meetings about how important public safety is and how it's been our number one goal. And I'm glad to see that that's coming to fruition. I am a <clears throat> slightly, you know, I don't guess, I don't know if disappointed is a quite the right word, but I would hope that more people would get involved and participate in, you know, what we're trying to accomplish here. I know a lot of people have opinions about it and lots to say, and, uh, you know, we're trying to make our decisions the, with the best information that gets provided to us, but what it comes down to is what the citizens want. And um, if we, the more participation, the better. And I think everybody that comes out here night after night and, and does all of that, but um, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, think that, you know, they have an opinion and I want to hear it. So I guess that's just, I'm asking for more people to get involved. Like Casey said, send us emails, um, we'd be happy to chat and hear what you have to say. Other than that, have a good night. Thank you. Council Member Cerverney. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I too would like to welcome everyone and thank you for coming once again. Um, Al, I always uh, appreciate all the dedication that you and Jim and all of your team have. Um, seeing the beautiful flags on the bridge um, is part of what makes our community special. And I think it puts smiles and heartwarming feelings um, for all of us every time we see them flying beautifully in the sky. I know every time I come across the bridge, it sure does. So thank you for um, whether it's rain, shine, or <laughs> all of the elements that you do for, to make that happen for us. Um, I'm so also sorry that I missed uh, this year's uh, Memorial Day um, presentation and honoring those that have served. I wasn't um, able to do so, but I always enjoy being there. It's very touching and moving. An important part of what we should recognize each and every year is the true meaning of Memorial Day it isn't the hot dogs, it isn't the barbecues, it isn't really the family gatherings, it's the people that have served. Um, um, I attended the La Center United um, community presentation and um, it, I think it helps parents understand how to have the dialogue with with their kids when they when they bring up difficult um, topics so i would encourage us to continue to be involved and go to the different types of sessions that uh, the center united hosts for the community it was good to see the turnout um, and a lot of questions you know hard questions were even asked by the attendees um, you know we're traveling new roads for all of us. So learning and opening up our mindsets and being willing to help the kids in any way that we can is always beneficial uh, for keeping um, our community what it is and our kids safe and on the right path and helping them um, wherever we need to. Um, I also want to mention, in addition to the graduation, we have the celebration of the accomplishments and scholarships um, that are held every year. And that is always a real um, amazing evening to celebrate the dedication that the students have and the awards that they win from uh, throughout Clark County and beyond. And the amount of money that flows through this little community is just totally um, amazing. And we're one of the few communities, I think, throughout Clark County. Um, I don't know what the total percentage is. Perhaps Peter can say. But the number of scholarships that our kids win is very um, high. And it's because all of us, um, you know, our organizations here in the community and community members and like-minded individuals and, and businesses and um, graduates alike come together to support one another and to make that um, additional schooling, whether it's vocational, technical, cosmetology, or a four-year or a doctorate degree, it doesn't matter. It shows the kids that they could try and put their minds um, to the goals that they and the passions that they have and accomplish them. So it's it's really a rewarding and heartwarming um, evening to attend. Um, and that's all. Thanks. Thank you. 
I did want to add one thing real quick. Um, our turnout for the Q&A session was excellent. So I wanted to thank everyone that attended, um, especially on a night that was competing with Peter in the awards and scholarship night, which I do apologize, Peter. We, we did not see that on the calendar, so it conflicted. But we had a great turnout. Um, it lasted for quite a while. I don't even think we left until after 8. Um, and we will be doing them, Kimberly, uh, every quarter. Okay? Thank you. That brings us to staff reports. Uh, Tony Cooper will present the CHIP SEAL staff report. Tony? City Council. My name is Tony Cooper. I'm the City uh, Engineer for the Center. And uh, this staff report is a request uh, to award... Tony, to can you pull the mic towards you a little, please? Thank okay. you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this staff report is to uh, request award for the 2023 uh, CHIP SEAL project on Highland Road and 339th. And um, pull this down a little bit. Uh, so just to, just to go into background about this, the city receives about $60,000 a year from gas tax and pavement and um, vehicle tabs. And that's an average. That's uh, over the years. That's kind of what it goes up and down. But um, um, that it, what what it's used for is for ba basically um, maintaining the pavement surface. Uh, in in many ways, it could be a chip seal, could be a slurry seal, could be an overlay. Uh, the the uh, operation staff use this uh, fund for building potholes, crack ceiling. So there's a lot of things that it's used for. But predominantly, it's supposed to be used for pavement preservation. Um, so the, the past year, that budget was, uh, that fund wasn't used. And so right now, there's about $97,000 in that pavement preservation budget. It's not called that in the, in the budget. I think it's called public works maintenance uh, in the budget. But that's, that's really what it's called. Um, so um, the city uh, city personnel evaluated the different roads in the center and tried to try to find the the one that would be uh, most worthy of of repairs. And what we found is that uh, that that Highland Road and 339th uh, has been has been wearing, has surface attrition, has some cracking in it, and it, it really needs some repairs. So um, uh, city staff. Put together some plans and uh, bid package and advertised it in the Columbian on May 16th. Uh, and the the plans were hosted on the city uh, website, so the contractors would just go to the website and download plans. Um, as it turns out, um, there was only one bid that came in. So just to just to kind of uh, give an overview of what the what was what was bid was. The, the chip seal itself was bid, which which is good, which extends from 24th to just uh, south of the high school, um, a little ways, about two or three hundred feet north of of Fourth uh, Street. And um, uh, there was a couple of different alternatives, and the reason why we did, we we uh, had alternatives was to make sure that we were staying in budget with this with this. Uh, uh, Budget that we have for paper preservation. The first one, the first alternate was is um, is to uh, stripe uh, stripe the road, and that includes centerline striping, uh, pavement um, reflectors, and crosswalk striping at the high school. So there was a lot of things on that that had to be striped. Uh, the second part of it was called a is called a fog seal, which a fog seal is really, um, it, it's, 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 it's an asphalt, a liquid asphalt. It has water and it's called an emulsion. Anyway, it, 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 um, sometimes it could, it could be sprayed on these chip seals and it, it makes the road a little bit more, you know, it, it's not as rough and that it also protects the road a little bit longer. It's not essential, but it, but it does help a little bit with the life of a, of a, a chip seal project. So those were the alternates. And so uh, Santa Fe, Sierra Santa Fe, um, is the contractor that bid it. They're a local contractor. They're out of uh, Ridgefield, and they build they, they bid a lot of projects around here. So um, their their budget was within the engineer's estimate. Engineer's estimate was just around one hundred thousand dollars, a little over one hundred thousand. So the base bid uh, that they bid was uh, fifty six thousand, just over fifty six thousand. 
the uh, alternate bid was just uh, under 17,000 alternate one and alternate two, which the Fox seal was a little over 20,000. 20, so the total of those three turned out to be uh, 93,777. And then the alternate uh, one with the base bid is 73,000, uh, $73,547. So, um, although although the entire bid was is within the budget of what we have, um, staff is not recommending doing all of those because there has to be some money left over for for maintenance program to you know use use that money for chip for um, uh, you know the the um, filling potholes and and the crack ceiling. So. Uh, what staff is is recommending is that we award the base bid with the alternate one, which, which is a striping for $73,547. And that leaves a little over $23,000 left in the budget so that that could be used throughout the rest of the year to, uh, you know, to do these other little repairs on the road. So I, I also have a bid tab here. There's not really much to it. It just shows the alternates. Uh, and the base bid and what I what I've summarized here, but that gives you an idea of what you know what goes into that bid. So um, that's a recommendation. Does does the council have any questions about it? Is there any warranty that comes with this work? No. Um, well, usually contractors will warranty something for about a year. So, but uh, this this. This contractor has done work for us before on Pacific Highway in 2016. They did a um, chip seal, and it, it lasted a long time. And there was some, you know, pavement um, overlays that were done due to the, some of the construction along Riverside, you know, Riverside Estates. But it lasted a long time. So, you know, I, I'm sure if, if something happened to it within a short time, I, I'm sure the contractor would would uh, you know, try to make amend that and try to try to repair that as best as possible. I don't think that's going to happen. That's just, you know, they they do, like I say, they do work all over the state and in mm -hmm. fact all over the West Coast. They're really reputable contractors. So, uh, and like I say, we've had we've seen their work before. So I don't anticipate anything happen, but you never know. But um, yeah. Um, does the fogging application does that give any sort of a length of time that it's going to further preserve it, it, the it will so what it does is it, it kind of seals that rock a little bit so it doesn't you, you know with the, with a chip seal cars driving over it eventually some of that rock pops out it, it, and uh over time the fog seal can kind of seal that and kind of prevent some of that from happening um you don't see those very much in residential streets because the chip seals you know they're kind of rough and so you, that's not an application you would use for that, but but on on you know Highland Road 339, that's perfect for that that type of application. But it does extend the life a little bit. How much I don't know, but but right now, like I say, it it would use up pretty much all the budget that we, yeah. that we have. What uh, replenishes what replenishes that budget? The, um, the, the vehicle tab, vehicle tabs, and gas tax. So every year, like I say. That's about what what comes in to the Seattle Center. All jurisdictions use that that for, for that. So kind of we budget. get roughly a hundred thousand dollars a year. About sixty thousand. Oh, I yeah, see. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, the the, oh, the bid wait, wait, wait. the bid was close to a hundred thousand for that project. We we didn't um, we didn't use that we didn't use that. Uh, Got it. Any of the budget la bit. last year. So there's two years of budget that is accumulated, but our Got maintenance okay. our maintenance guys have used some of that budget so and when it what day of the year does that happen on so like on uh, what day of the year the, the project will when they will start no i just mean like when does that money i think it comes in throughout the year oh, um, it does. and, and our street fund is basically year. combined oh, with um so it's vehicle tab uh or fuel tax revenues and then the general fund can also and often does supplement our street fund i see yeah Okay. I mean, I never agree with like totally emptying a fund, but <laughs> I don't think so. And this may not pertain specifically to this, but I'm just curious, uh, where did the funding come from for the crack ceiling that we just did last year, I believe? 
that was from this same street fund. So oh. we, we generally do that uh, with our own crews and our own equipment, so we don't have to bid that work out. Okay. Um, but, you know, we actually, as Tony mentioned, we didn't do a project last year, so we specifically increased the budget this year so we could do a larger project. Um, a portion of that money that's staying in this fund, uh, I'm hoping to use for a pavement condition index of city streets so that we can um, have a model to look at, you know, not only what streets are where we should be focusing our funds on to preserve them so that they don't degrade and cost additional money to repair, uh, but then it also can be a tool that we can and the council can use as we're looking at other funding options like tab fees potentially in the future for uh, road maintenance and what it really costs to maintain uh, and keep our roads in a serviceable condition. Thank you. Brian, I have a question, another question for you. Um, and you can help my memory. There were a couple of projects that you brought forward earlier in the year that were over budget. Do they come from a separate account? So the community center was one that would be um, from the capital projects fund, okay. um, which is a little bit different. I thought fund. there was a road project that you um, presented. Yeah, and then we had the sinkhole. Uh, which again would be a stormwater fund instead of the road fund. So uh, neither of the current over budget projects or unexpected projects um, would impact this road fund, um, but we will be probably talking to you later this year about a budget amendment to, to replenish or um, backfill for those projects. Okay, so we're not impacting. If yeah. we have another ICE event, does that get paid for through this? So this is the street maintenance fund. So an ICE event where our crews are out, you know, working overtime plowing would come from, you know, same road fund, but a different line item. Uh, this is specifically for maintenance. That would be like a labor line item that would increase for, um, okay. for, for all the time. What about the plowing. sand and gravel and spray that goes down? Uh, generally, we have enough of that on hand and it's, it's not a huge cost overall compared to, to other work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a oh, please. inquiry here. So the, the number there is to be plus tax, correct? It, it is uh, taxes included. Taxes in that. included. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because it's a pavement project. Okay. Yes. The other um, question I had, and again, is has the city adopted it like a 10% cost overrun authority to the administration, or is that if they go over, they have to come back? Um, well, I, I know, I know. What we're supposed to do is is uh, come back to to council and and give an overview, a staff report of what you know a project after it's done. And at that time, we would probably bring that up. It it, it would have to depend on it would depend on where you know if, if overall if our projects are under budget, all the projects are under budget, all the, the you know street projects and others the other projects within that are within budget. If not, there has to be a budget amendment. But it kind of depends on, on we don't have that, uh, what you're talking about, the 10%. But, but we, we are required to, to come before council and, and give staff reports at the end of projects. So you don't, you don't build that into your motion then? It's a case by case, you have to bring it back? It's case by case, okay. yeah. Thank you. Tony, do we have other projects that are coming before us? For the summer, um, we we have one that's probably going through the sewer fund, which was the actuator valve installation. Uh, it's the we have to replace a valve up there on uh, on the force main, and so I think that's that's not. I don't know if that's in the sewer budget or not. We haven't discussed that, but it's if it's a necessary thing for the sewer system. Yeah, that one was budgeted in sewer. I don't think we have any other road projects planned this year. We have a few other design projects that are road projects that will be coming to council. But as far as construction projects um, for this road specifically, um, I think this is the last one that we have planned this year. Okay. I'm not thinking of any others off the top of my head. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? Can I get a motion? Um, I move to award the bid from Sierra Santa Fe in the amount of $73,547.00. Second. 
Second. It's been moved and second. <laughs> Can I get a roll call? Or are we going to do roll? No, we'll just do a, yeah. All those in favor, aye. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion passes. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Brian. All right. Next up, Brian Cast will present the Public Works and Community Development Staff Report. Brian? Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, hit a few highlights here. Uh, first, I, I wanted to thank Tony for um, putting together all the bid documents and the plans for that work. Um, it's good to have a, a road maintenance project going here. So, like I said, we missed one last year. So, um, we're excited to, to have that structure and road be uh, improved before there's some development happening that we'll be talking about here in just a moment. Uh, on the public works side, um, it's summer and painting work has begun on our streets. We started out with the uh, paw prints in, in advance of the graduation um, to make sure that those were painted and visible for our graduating class. Um, and then we'll also be moving on to streets or uh, center lines, curbs, fog lines, all that sort of stuff, crosswalks as well. Um, in the park section, the splash pad uh, equipment is up and in place, and we will be making the splash pad operational on the 16th after school is out. Uh, over in wastewater, um, Emery Oldman, uh, who is our operator in training, uh, is progressing well. He's now uh, past his 30 day um, of his 30 day, 30, 60, 90 day um, orientation successfully. And he is also at the point where he's able to um, go on call and work weekends to help bring some relief to um, Bill and to Jay. Uh, so that's, we're excited to be growing our wastewater staff from within. Um, we also, uh, our staff found and repaired a uh, potable water leak on the line that serves the um, laboratory building. And based on the reduction in water uses, we anticipate that that's going to save $18,000 a year. Uh, so a pretty significant um, leak that we've found and repaired there. Um, we also worked with Clark PUD and they um, gave us a $1,000 relief um, for completing that work. So. Um, Nice work to the staff there. Um, we had been seeing some water for a little while and we're under the impression it was groundwater, um, but it turned out it was potable water leak. So uh, kudos to Jay for uh, finding that and, and finding the location of it and getting it fixed. Uh, on the engineering side, um, if you recall, we received about an $800,000 grant for the citywide systematic horizontal curve warning sign and roadway departure. It's a very long project. Basically, this is a safety project, uh, signage, striping, and um, other roadway treatments to help uh, people stay on the road instead of go off the road. Um, we had uh, put out that out for proposals. Uh, the first round, we actually did not receive any proposals, so we went out again and received two proposals, and we have selected an engineering firm by the name of DJ&A. Um, they are new to working with the city, but um, the project manager actually lives in town here, so we are looking forward to working with them on that project. Um, we have to work with WashDOT to get that awarded, but uh, we hope to have that design underway, or the design contract um, to council here soon for approval so that we can get the design underway. Uh, over on the community center, uh, Lee Contractors is making good progress. The uh, appliances are all here, the hood's here. Uh, they're working on the hood um, installation as we speak. And uh, we also have coordinated with them on parking lot repairs. This is the other portion of that contract. Um, and they are planning to start that work uh, after the Little League season wraps up on the 9th of July and have everything done and the parking lot uh, ready, hopefully, in time for our days. If the paving's not done, the parking lot will still be gravel and usable, however, for our days, and that is a requirement of the contract. Hey, Brian, with yes. the um, community center, I was just curious, is, uh, I don't even know what to call it, the thing that's being built on top of it, is that just architectural, or is that? It uh, screens the uh, hood vent outlet. Oh, okay, nice. It's gonna, it looks like it's gonna look nice. Yeah, it, just, or they're going to paint it so that it matches the rest of the building, um, and it just it kind of blocks the big metal structure is where, where they, uh, the new fancy hood vents out. Nice. <laughs> uh, 
Um, one other item that's not on the list here that I want to cover, uh, we had a coordination meeting with WashDOT about their summer work on I-5, and one of the main projects that's going to be impacting the city here is uh, the North Brown um, Bridge over the North Fork, which is the one just south of Woodland, right before you get to Woodland. Um, that work is going to be starting in July and is a two-month project to um, repair the deck. Um, if you probably noticed, there's um, trucks have to drive in the center, um, so it's basically fixing that um, the deficiencies in that structure. However, um, it's going to have some pretty significant traffic prob um, backups that are caused during that two months of work. Um, the wash dot is expecting a seven mile backup on Fridays, which would be um, all the way past Ridgefield and three to five miles other days of the week. So um, we're working with WashDOT and our partners up in Woodland to try and, you know, mitigate as best we can for people that decide that they're tired of waiting in traffic and cutting through town here um, up to Woodland and bypassing that. Um, but inevitably, there will be some some traffic impacts on our local streets from July through September. Um, so as I as we have more information on that, we'll share that. But um, something to keep in mind, and and we're going to be reaching out to the community and informing as well. Um, five to seven board. mile backups? Five to seven mile backups. So you're saying I-5 north, right? Northbound. From like Woodland all the way back. Almost exactly. Like, so yeah. from like the south side of yeah. Woodland all the way probably to around the rest areas on and Fridays. And they're just projecting on Fridays that or not every day of the week? Friday's the worst day. Sure. Um, so so Friday is like a seven mile backup. And yeah, and I think uh, <laughs> Mondays, Monday through Thursday were five and on the weekends it was three or something like that. But uh, yeah. Obviously pretty, peak times and that's and all the that. Peak time yeah. Backup, wow. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. So good to know. Yikes. <laughs> uh, over on the building department That's side, um, permits are continuing to come in um, at, a, at a pretty steady pace. Uh, at, to date, we're at 172 permits this year, including uh, 73 single family homes and a commercial uh, tenant improvement project. Um, we already, let's see here, uh, Riverside, they have uh, 40 homes currently under construction there in Riverside. Um, and seven of those have received occupancy. On to the community development map, just a couple things to highlight here. Um, out at the junction, um, the convenience store framing is continuing to progress and we understand that the uh, hotel construction is, will be starting in August out there. Um, and then over on the uh, east side of town, there's uh, several projects that are going to be starting up construction here in the near future. Project number one on the list, Lockwood Meadows, uh, we anticipate giving them a grading permit here probably in the next week or so. Um, and then also uh, 37 Aces View and 44 Valley View um, are progressing through engineering review as well. So um, our anticipation is that all three of those projects will be under construction um, here in the next month or so. With that, happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Um, is there going, has there been any talks with those contractors about, because we had the problem with the dust last year up at Stevens Landing. Yeah, so in our pre-construction meetings, we'll address that with them. It's, you know, it happens every year where the soil's really good till it's not and it gets dry and then it goes from, you know, too wet to dusty pretty quick. So um, really just working with them to make sure that they're, um, you know, keeping water, their water trucks circulating and, um, you know, ideally sticking to rock tall routes instead of going through the dust. But uh, I anticipate, you know, it's going to be a, a point of coordination with them um, on these projects, just like every project. Do we have somebody, oh geez, do we have somebody that kind of oversees it's really a staff level effort, so it's Tony out there a lot, or myself. Um, it really Tony's doing the on the on boots on the ground inspection on all these projects. Okay. All right, yeah. Just last year, I did go around. There are some of my friends that live up in those neighborhoods. They did see a significant amount of dust, and hopefully, we can try and prevent that. Yep. Brian, will we be um, putting a article in the reflector in the Columbian about the chip ceiling project? Because there's going to be a lot of traffic um, that's impacted that comes from the north, um, not only just the local traffic, 
plus the construction traffic up there on 339th? Yeah, we will do some outreach. The good thing about a chip seal project is that they can they can go relatively quickly. Right. So it's you know it's only a day or two of impact. Them plan. But yeah, we will. We'll, as we get that schedule, um, there's traffic control requirements, and we'll, we'll do outreach through the website okay. and, and otherwise as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you, Brian. We do have two ordinances on the agenda tonight. First one, Brian Cast will present Ordinance 2023-08 Illicit Discharge Code. It's such a horrible title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we should have jazzed that one up a little bit. Uh, thank you again, Mayor. Um, so as we discussed at the first look, um, we really currently, with our city code have a, a limited ability to regulate um, discharges or dumping to our storm sewer system and the water that enters uh, the catch basins and goes through the storm sewer system ultimately ends up uh, in our surface waters in town here, whether that's wetlands or um, the East Fork of the Lewis River. Um, and discharges that are not storm water or um, you know, pollutants like paint or something like that can harm not only the wildlife that lives there, but the habitat, um, and it can also damage the infrastructure itself. So. Um, to address that, we are proposing to add a new chapter to Title 13 of the city's code that will give us the ability to regulate uh, discharges to the storm sewer system. Um, the code includes process to inspect, regulate, and enforce discharges. Um, and enforcement would include potential suspension of connections, uh, written warnings, and the ability for the city to cover costs of remediation if there is any cleanup costs. Uh, associated with um, someone dumping something to the storm system. So uh, at this time, happy to answer any questions about the ordinance. Uh, since the last time, the, the only change has been um, the elimination of uh, discussion of um, wash water from car washing activities, uh, as council requested. Uh, the rest of the code remains the same. So um, happy to answer any questions before council opens the public hearing. Uh, and then if there's any comments or questions from the public, we'll happy to address those as well. Any questions? No. Straightforward. All right. All right. At this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing at 724. Are there any public hearing comments from the audience? Kimberly Goheen Elvin. Um, let me see here. I wrote some notes. Well, as far as that leak, I saw it a few months ago. And I'm wondering, I, I now know I was going to ask if it was fixed. Um, what I'd like to know is was it polluted? And um, uh, it, kind of what, what, what was uh, you know, in that leak? And then, um, let me see here. Uh, we have had a, quite a few nice weekends here prior to you opening up the water park. I'd kind of like to see it opened up maybe in um, May. You know, we can do a 10-day, 20-day forecast. I was looking out there, and it wasn't there a few days ago, and I thought, boy, those kids would just love that water park today. So if it's not anything that's too hard, Maybe that next week or uh, next year, let's you know look up the uh, the weather for that. I do appreciate the quarterly town halls, um, and uh, let's see. Well, the stormwater <clears throat> has, has there been an example of somebody doing that? I mean, we're not going to want to flush stuff down our toilet, and I'm going to say it tonight. I've had this on my heart for a few years. If women, uh, the oceans are full of wood fiber, and the wood fiber gets into our fish, their lung or their gills, right? So it's only natural that we're polluting the hell out of the earth. With that said, it, it's just a hygiene thing, but if women could somehow take their toilet paper and put it in a bag, put it to the earth, burn it, whatever, instead of putting it down the toilet, think of the millions and millions and billions of, you know, saving 
are water. It's a, I know it starts at home, folks. It's a good laughing thing here, but really, if you think about it, you know, you're going to put it somewhere. Do we want to put it down the toilet or put it in a paper bag? Thank you. Any other public uh, comments from the audience? You know, I took a few minutes to look at the uh, two people that are uh, here going to be voted on or whatever you guys Kimberly, do to, for that. Kimberly, yeah, the three minutes are up. And oh, they were? Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I just wanted to say that uh, one was very lengthy and I appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Are there any comments from those calling in? If there are, press star six to unmute yourselves and speak. Do we still have callers, clerk? Okay. Are there any comments to be read? There are none. Okay. Oh, there are. Oh, I thought you said there are. Yeah. Oh, I was like, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> I move to adopt ordinance. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, I have sorry. to close. Yeah, I have to close. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. All right. If there's no other comments at this time, I'd like to now close the public hearing at 728. And Are there... I'll briefly address the, the questions that were raised. Okay. Um, so the, the discharge from the wastewater treatment plant, um, if you were walking along, it's sort of tangentially related to this. So if you were walking along the trail there below the treatment plant, um, you know, over the last six, eight months, there was water sort of seeping from the hillside. It was uh, drinking a drinking water leak. So it was the, the potable water line that serves the laboratory there that, that was the leak that was repaired. Um, so, you know, not sewage and not harmful, um, but still not ideal, wasting water. Um, and we actually have had a few instances of folks dumping stuff, you know, paints, oils, otherwise to the system, um, which is really the impetus behind this this code. So. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other comments from council? If not, can I get a motion for this ordinance, please? I move to adopt ordinance 2023-08 as presented. Second. All right. Since this is an ordinance, I would like a roll call on this, please. Councilmember Fox? Yes. Councilmember Casper? Yes. Councilmember Boyle? Yes. Council Member Cervini? Yes. Mayor Thornton? Mayor Strobin? I, I don't know. <laughs> Ordinance passes. <laughs> Thank you, Council and Clerk. <laughs> we're not laughing at you. We're laughing. It's been a long day, everyone, just so you know. All well, right. It's a team. We work together. That's right. It's a team. <laughs> Okay, next up is Ordinance 2023-10, Drug Possession. Um, and this one will be presented by the City Attorney, Sean McPherson. Mayor, Council, um, just a quick, quick background. Uh, again, this is my second meeting covering for Bronson. I'm the City Attorney for Camas, also City Attorney for White Salmon, and happy to have to be here. I'm happy to have worked, actually, on this um, uh, new ordinance. Um, quick background. Um, I think most folks are familiar with this, but essentially back in February 2021, the Washington Supreme Court invalidated and declared unconstitutional um, Washington's strict liability drug possession laws, and that related to cocaine, heroin, fent fentanyl. Um, the legislature provided for a fix in the summer of 2021, um, but in that fix, they indicated that for the first two um, arrests that they were referred to uh, treatment um, and it made it very difficult for law enforcement to, to enforce. Um, the legislative session for this last session came in and the legislature finished that session, the regular session, without adopting a fix. And so the governor called them back into special session and said, this is your sole task, get this fixed. And they came up with, I think it took them a day, they came up with a fix. And so this is what we call the Blake fix Essentially, um, the timing is such, and the requirement is that for local enforcement purposes and what they've indicated now for drug possession, it's a, a gross misdemeanor 
which falls within the purview of uh, the local municipalities as far as their enforcement powers, but you have to adopt it uh, by reference. And so the purpose of this ordinance before you today is to adopt by reference um, the uh, changes to chapter 6950 in the RCW into the list center municipal code. That'll allow, uh, again, effective as of July 1 uh, for enforcement to occur. So that's the presentation as far as uh, you know what the intent is. It's uh, it's a good fix, and I'd uh, urge the council to adopt it. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the city attorney? No. No. no? Okay. All right, Kimberly. At this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing at 7.33. Are there any public hearing comments from the audience? Can you please step up to the podium, Kimberly? We have to have it recorded. Thank you. Kimberly Goheen, Elvin. I, I would like a more in-depth um, description of what you're uh, saying especially when it has to do with Olympia and Inslee and uh, legislation. I want to say something about that. Legislators um, actually are not elected. They write laws and they put it through to those of us to satisfy the citizens through a process. But those people that write these things and what's been going on since this pandemic, they have an agenda just like Vancouver City Council, they have a, they're members of the United Nations. So anyway, sorry I'm out of breath. I'm actually trying to quit smoking, so amen. Good luck. So real quick, Kimberly, this was posted in our agenda packet. Uh, yeah, so you'd be able to find all that information of what the ordinance actually included. This has also been publicized in the news, or in the news um, since it passed in May. Was it in May, Casey? May, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's been highly noted throughout the community and the state of Washington. Um, if you go back through the agenda, you'll be able to read up about it. The council's been, we, we've had a few meetings on it, so the council's very aware of this entire ordinance. So that's why the briefing or the description was briefed. Are there any other public hearing comments? Al Villa, 152 West 15th Street. You know, if you don't pass this, that means you got nothing to enforce. You know, so I strongly recommend that you vote yes. Thank you. God bless America. Thank you, Al. Any other comments from the audience? For those that are calling in, please hit star six to unmute yourself and state your name. Are there any uh, comments to be read, Clerk? None. All right. I would like to now close the public hearing at 7.35. Are there any other comments from the council? No. Yes. 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 Um, I couldn't agree with you more, Al. This particular ordinance gives us, um, as far as a, a municipality and the um, police that cover our area, the authority to actually deal with um, those that have illicit drugs, which is a more appropriate title for this particular <laughs> than um, the sewer discharge. But I'm getting beside myself. Uh, so I think, you know, it's imperative that, that we really pass this ordinance to give them the power to actually pull over and, and, and in, as well as address the um, those that have these and that are impacting that our kids, and um, you know it, it's the only option that we really have. We we certainly wish that the legislature would have written um, a stronger and and more effective and and more broadly written for uh, language, but this is what we get. So to give them the power. Um, for our local feet on the street, um, this is really what we need to do as a council. 
I'll just add to that that uh, you know this this RCW the 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 decision that was passed in the in the uh, extended session is far better than what the expiring Blake fix the Blake decision was. Um, it's not perfect, you know. It could be a lot better, like like Council Member Servany said, but it's definitely far better than what it was. Um, and the, the other thing I think that we need to keep in mind is is and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the legislation specifically stated that a, a city can't make a more restrictive drug possession. So um, it's kind of twofold. We're not able to make it any more restrictive, and we need it in, in place so that municipal police can enforce this under city code. Yes, that's correct. They, Thank you. The legislature preempted, they call it preempted the field. In other words, local jurisdictions aren't um, uh, allowed by law to step in and create anything more restrictive. So that's called, that's the concept of preemption, and that's what the legislature specifically indicated in this in this legislation. So you're correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Can I get a motion, please? I'd like to make a motion um, to approve Ordinance 2023-10. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. Can I get a roll call vote on that, please? We'll try this again. <laughs> Councilmember Fox? Yes. Councilmember Casberg? Yes. Councilmember Boyle? Yes. Councilmember Servany? Yes. All right. Ordinance passes. Thank you, Council. <laughs> All right. That takes us to, we have no consent, I'm finished, new business. Council, we do have new business on the agenda this evening. Maria swinger Inskeep will be going over the interview process to fill the vacancy for City Council position number four. Good Maria? evening. So the way that this will work is that we have pre-submitted questions from the current council members. We will interview one candidate at a time while the other candidate is in the conference room. We will then switch and interview the second candidate. They will have a time of three minutes per question. Council will then break to executive session and come back and make a motion to appoint one of the candidates. Council, do you have any questions? Okay. So we'll start with Ms. Linda Tracy. And Alex, if you can please escort Ms. Myrna Leha to the conference room, I would appreciate it. Thank you. So Linda, if you want to come to the microphone, I will read the questions, but you also are welcome to make notes on the paper that's in front of you if you'd like to. So the first question was submitted by Council Member Servany. And it is, what specific areas do you feel the council needs to improve upon to further strengthen the city, creating a more resilient, thriving community? I, I think just outreach into the, into the city. You know, when I was on city council before, people would come to me and they would complain about a certain subject. And I would always say, go to the city council. Speak your mind. And I think more outreach into the community saying, people, we're not awful people. We would be more than happy to hear your questions and your concerns. And I just think that the more people that come f with questions and concerns, the better the council is able to adapt and work on those things. So thank you. Next question was submitted by Council Member Fox. And she said, how can you add value to our current council? I think sort of the same thing. I think, I think the, more, the more we're involved in our community, the more we have um, thoughts and, and um, reasons for why we need to be involved in our community will add depth to us as a council. I know when I was on council before, years ago, everything that I 
heard, everything that I um, committed myself to, to participating in, I learned more about the city and, and more about how it worked and more about the wastewater treatment plan and more about the finances. And it just gave me more depth. And I would always say to myself, wow, I never knew that that's <laughs> how that worked. So I think that that would be a good way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question was submitted by Council Member Boyle. Besides working on behalf of our constituents, how else do you plan to establish yourself as a leader in the community? Well, I'm, 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 I think I am certainly a leader in the community already. Um, and I think there's always room for improvement. I've, I'm uh, getting ready to celebrate 20 years with the Miss Tingla Center Scholarship Program this year. Um, I was one of the presidents of the La Center City Council, the La Center uh, Chamber of Commerce years ago. Um, I was mayor pro tem for a couple years on the council. I'm a member of the Our Days Committee. So I try to get out as much as I can. I'm involved with the schools because I have grandchildren that go to the schools. So if people don't know me, <laughs> they haven't been around, I'm sorry. <laughs> so. And, and I'm always available if somebody wants me. I, I think I think that that's the most important thing. So, thank you. You're welcome. And lastly, Councilmember Casper said, "What are your thoughts on promoting development and creating sustainable sources of revenue for the city?" Yeah, that's a tough one. That's something that I have thought about since 2000, since I first moved here. Um, obviously, we all know that the problem with La Center is we have what about a, 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 a one square mile of, of city property. It's helped that we have now urban growth that has gone up to the to the uh, the junction. You know, I I would love to have more businesses. I would love to figure out what the card rooms are going to do. Like I, I know that the palace has now sold. What are they going to do with chips? Is that something that we're going to be able to use? Um, there was a time years ago that we talked about on the city council where the Mexican restaurant and the tavern is building something on the back like a little strip mall and having more businesses. I don't know where we can put them, but I would sure like to uh, to figure that out. I'm so pleased that we're going to have a coffee shop that's going to go into the old bank building. That's going to be, you know, because what I said was, since we don't have Giovanni's anymore, we had pizza and ice cream, and now they're going to bring in ice cream. So that's going to be fun for the kids. And, yeah, I, I think... I think bringing in more business is what we need to try to do. I'm not sure how we can do that, but but uh, maybe we need to extend our city our city limits a little bit. But thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So, Linda, Alex will actually take you to the conference room. Good evening, Myrna, if you want to come to the podium. The questions are up there. I don't think she wrote on them. You're welcome to if you need to jot any notes but so you can see them. So the first question was submitted by Council Member Servany. What specific areas do you feel the council needs to improve upon to further strengthen the city, creating a more resilient, thriving community? And you have three minutes. And you can pull that mic down. Yes, you can. I always have to do that. That's OK. <laughs> I really would like to see um, the police protection. I know, like uh, Sean said, uh, beating that subject to death, but I'd like to see the police pr protection, that to get resolved. I know Chief Richardson's been working on that. And um, I really would like to see a, a connection in the community. Um, I've been going to the school board meetings, and I really would like to see some um, communication between different people, like uh, Liz Servany mentioned, 
that she had gone to that uh, courageous, um, I forget what the whole title of it was, that she went to that. Courageous discussions. Courageous, yes. Um, so I, I want to see a closeness in our community and uh, the police protection. Um, I would like to see some businesses because I think we need that to get the infrastructure, the money for the infrastructure. Um, and um, otherwise, I'm just, I love the city and I think, uh, there's just a great community to live in. Thank you. Next question was submitted by Council Member Fox. How can you add value to our current council? Well, once again, because I come from a law enforcement background, I do know a lot of people, and I feel like that could be very helpful in uh, bringing the police protection to the city. And, um, I just feel because I am good at communicating with people, that I love everybody and I can talk to people and I just feel really, um, because my heart's desire is to do the best that I can for this community. Um, I'm going to be joining the, the Lions Club. Um, I'm going to be very involved. I've been very civically involved as far as Clark County goes and now it's going to be really focused on what I can do for this city and listening to the constituents. and really wanting to give a voice to everybody and to do what the constituents want for this city. Thank you. The next question kind of touches upon that, is submitted by Councilmember Boyle. Besides working on behalf of our constituents, how else do you plan to establish yourself as a leader in the community? Well, <laughs> I did sort of answer that one. Uh, being involved in the Lions Club, I think, is very important. Uh, being on the city council is very important, um, and just my communication with people. I I go out every day and I walk usually every morning and every evening and I talk to people and I ask them what are they concerned about. And the main issue is police and inflation, and um, I just really want to hear what they have to say about that. And they don't want the city to be too big. Uh, too much construction, but on the other hand, they realize that we do need to have, you know, uh, the construction and we need businesses so we can have money for the infrastructure. It all comes back to that again. And lastly, Council Member Kasberg said, what are your thoughts on promoting development and creating sustainable sources of revenue for the city? Uh, actually, I do want to see that because I don't see any way else that we can have the money to pay for the inf infrastructure. So we do have to have some building. We have to be responsible in that and what businesses that we can bring in, but we really do need to do that. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you. I was waiting for her to come back before we move forward. Okay, thank you candidates. We will now be going into an executive session for 10 minutes to discuss the qualifications of the applicants. All right, and the time is 7.51. Just to indicate, to clarify the record, decisions will be made upon return. Oh, yes.
Excuse me. Uh, thank you. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Uh, we come in out of executive, executive session at 8.02. First of all, I'd like to thank both the candidates. Uh, you're both qualified. Um, I enjoy seeing both of you up here and also in the general election. At this point, council, can I get a motion to nominate an applicant for the council's, uh, city council position number four? So move. Someone make a motion on first. Okay. I make a motion to appoint Myrna Leha as city council position number four. I second that. That's it. Can we get a roll call vote, please, clerk? Councilmember Fox? Yes. Councilmember Casberg? Yes. Councilmember Boyle? Yes. Councilmember Cervini? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Council. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to both of you. Yes, thank you. Thank Appreciate you your time. And good luck. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. The City Clerk and Director of Administrative Services, Maria Swinger Inskeep, will be swearing in Myrna Leha for the City Council position number four. Oh, you guys don't want to be in pictures? <laughs> okay, Myrna, if you could raise your right hand and please repeat after me. I state your name here, and you can read it there too if you want. I do solemnly swear that I am a citizen of the United States and the state of Washington. that I will support the Constitution and the laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Washington and will to the best of my judgment, skill, and ability truly, faithfully, diligently, and impatient, impartially <laughs> Perform the duties of the office of council member position for city of the center. In and for Clark County in the state of Washington. As such duties are prescribed by law. Congratulations, council member Leha. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. That concludes our meeting for tonight. Can I get a motion to close? So moved. Second. Motion passes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> opposed? Aye. I oppose. I oppose. I'm kidding. I'm abstain. I know. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> Motion passes. Thank you, Council. Thank you, everyone, for attending.